saben que tenemos que apagar todos los micrófonos para que funcione bien la charla y vayamos todos en orden. Si quieren preguntar algo, eh, ahí hay un link para levantar la mano. También en el chat eh, pueden escribir sus preguntas y con mucho gusto se las, comenzamos, se las comentamos al doctor y, y así nos va a ir muy bien. Buenos días con todos. Eh, ya son más de las 11 y 35 de la mañana. Generalmente empezamos 11 y 35 en punto. Eh, le damos la bienvenida nuevamente al doctor Davinder, que por segunda vez nos va a dar una presentación. La primera fue de GAT, que estuvo excelente. Y ahora nos va a hablar acerca de técnicas innovativas en glaucoma, así como también... Eh, revisiones de trabeculectomías eh, ya fallidas por ave interno, o sea, sin entrar, sin abrir la conjuntiva, sino entrando por cámara anterior, eh, entrar por la esclerectomía y resolverlas de esa forma. Entonces, son innovaciones en glaucoma y más. Eh, thank you very much for uh, your presentation, Davinder, again. Thank you very, very much for participate and uh, welcome, welcome again to these webinars. Thanks. Thanks, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Carlos. It's a, a pleasure to, to be back with everybody and to have this opportunity to have another exchange during these, these crazy times. Um, today, I'm just going to talk about some ideas we've had um, here over the past uh, maybe 10 years now um, on ways of trying to make glaucoma surgery uh, maybe better and safer. Uh, again, with the thinking of making this better and safer in a cost-effective way. Uh, these are my disclosures, again, none of which I think are pertinent to anything we're going to talk about today. Um, you know, we're, we're all kind of trying to make light of this uh, coronavirus. And this is one of my, you know, the comics are coming out and um, it's a great opportunity to have a moment in, in spite of all this to laugh. So, you know, who thought the coronavirus could uh, do what no woman has been able to do, which was stop all sports, shut down bars and keep all the men at home. So... It's one of my favorite comics so far. Um, so yeah, it's basically adventures in glaucoma over the past 10 years. And I'm going to talk about a couple of things we've been playing with um, and, um, and really focus on, on these four things, uh, on uh, ab internal blood revision, uh, a double muscle speculum, uh, management of tube associated hypotony, um, and then uh, a conjunctival pedicle flap for the repair of complex tube erosions. Uh, some of the other stuff I'm not gonna talk about, but you can, if you go to my YouTube channel, you can watch some of these videos and, and other things. You know, but the overlying theme is, is really, when you're in clinic every day, uh, there's so much we don't understand about ophthalmology, so much we don't understand about glaucoma. And, and think of your, if you think of your clinic as your own laboratory, where you're learning every day um, about the disease. And, and really, if you're not learning from your patients, uh, you're not paying attention. So they're, they're, they teach us every day if you pay attention. And these are examples of where I think my patients have taught me to be better. Um, and one was uh, using this technique we described back in 2017 uh, with an ab internal blood revision. And this is what the spatula looks like. It's, I think it's like $100 or $200. Um, and I can get you the information for the guy who designed it for me. But it's really an 18 millimeter long spatula that, uh, that has a slight curve, and then the tip is a little blunted. Uh, it's a little flat as a blunt with a kind of a sharp side, and you'll see how I use it. Um, and what I do is, this is a left eye. I'm sitting temporal. I make an inferior paracentesis reach across the anterior chamber and then here is an upside down view. So this is the superior angle, and that's the sclerotomy site. So I go across the angle, go find the sclerotomy, I go through the sclerotomy, and then I come off the eye with the gonio prism. And here we have the spatula reaching, reaching across the anterior chamber, underneath the flap, dissecting posteriorly, and then this thing is just a, a, my traction suture. It's an adovicral traction suture used to control the eye. And then you just dissect bluntly just the posterior aspect of the flap. And the blue helps you shine through and you can see where it is, but it's blunt. So it won't perforate through the conjunctiva. 
uh, and then you see this nice bleb form and you see a nice posterior bleb form. Now what's interesting, and I didn't realize this when we were designing this instrument and when I was thinking about this technique, is that when you're going, you know, some people say, well, why don't you just do a needling at the slit lamp, which is fine. But when you needle at the slit lamp, you go through the conjunctiva, which had blood, has blood vessels, and you're more likely to break a blood vessel um, when you're doing it. Then you break a blood vessel, you get a lot of blood underneath the conjunctiva and it messes up your view. Through this technique, you're going within the eye, underneath the scleral flap, and you're breaking avascular fibrotic tissue. So tissue that doesn't have any blood vessels. So you're not likely to break any blood vessels. And so you typically just see down to the bottom right of the screen, you see this diffuse bleb without any blood, without any inflammation. And, um, and so when do I use it? I do this in a patient that has a scarred flat bleb, maybe in a teen on cyst. And a teen on cyst is a different beast than just a scarred bleb. And a teen on cyst, Sometimes you can break it with some, uh, some a 23 gauge, 27 gauge needle and break it down. Other times it won't work and then you can kind of go through here. Um, or I do it in situations where a patient has a failed bleb and I don't want to put in a tube in the eye or anything like that or do a second trap. Or we all have these cases where a patient has a functioning bleb and everything is great. And then we do a FACO and then the bleb scars. And then we have to go back in and you can open it up this way. Um, what I typically do is, here it says one week prior, but sometimes I even just do it right before the surgery um, in, the, in the operating room. I'll rotate the globe down and inject mitomycin C. Usually maybe 0.2 um, of, of 0.2 mito, so about 40 micrograms of mito. Um, but we're pushing our doses a little bit. But you, the key is to inject it way far back, far, far back in the, um, um, in the far fornix away from the limbus where you're directing flow. So here's a video of it. Um, and, um, and in this situation, I'm, again, it's a left eye, I'm sitting temporal, um, and you can see the scarred bleb right up top here. So I'm making an inferior paracentesis, there's the iridectomy. Here I'm using my second instrument, I made two paracentesis, but you can also uh, use a traction suture to rotate the globe down. And that's the spatula. It's, it's 18 millimeters long. It's longer than a psychodialysis spatula and uh, it's blunter and it's less likely to perforate. The first time I did this was with a psychodialysis spatula, but you realize the 18 millimeter length. So here's going through the ostomy right here. And you wanna make sure you don't, you know where you're going because you can create an iridodialysis or a psychodialysis if you're not careful. And you gotta flip your brain upside down because you're looking through a gonio prism. And then once you're embedded in there, then I use the, either the second instrument or a, um, a traction suture to rotate the globe down and control the eye. And then here you can see, um, you know, you're breaking and there's, you're breaking through the scar tissue. And there's usually two kind of rings of steel or two layers of scar tissue. And you can feel yourself going through one and then you can feel yourself going through the other. And you really want to dissect posterior and you can see, thankfully the instrument's blue. So you can see the blue shining through the conjunctiva. And I'm just unroofing the posterior aspect of the flap. So you can get that low diffuse posterior bleb, right? So I'm right, we're not working right here. And I always throw a suture in here just in case the pressure goes too low. I put in two 10 nylon sutures and I'm pumping up the eye with and washing out the helon. And then I'm going to put some helon in the eye because the pressure is going to be low and you want to protect the pressure from going too low. But you can see that nice diffuse posterior bleb. So you want to pressurize the eye and usually you won't be able to pressurize it too much because you've just opened up a big portion of the flap. But, uh, but this is what they look like before. And these are the kind of blebs you see afterwards, this nice, low, diffuse, posterior bleb. Um, really just a nice example of, um, you know, here's the preoperative bleb flat, and you see the same patient, the postoperative bleb, low, diffuse, posterior bleb, the blebs we all dream about. And here's an example. Okay, this is a case, in, he had pigmentary dispersion syndrome. I did a trab on him, it worked great, and then I had to do a cataract surgery. After the cataract surgery, it failed, and I went back in and did this bleb, and now he's back to 11 on no medications. Um, and this is what he looked like at nine months after the bleb revision. So we reported our outcomes in 21 patients. Um, I mean, there, sorry, 
Yes. In, when you're doing this technique, uh, you told us that you put in the temporal side, right? Uh, correct. Yes. And where do you put your incision? At what hour to have more comfort in this technique? Because it's a difficult position, right? Um, yeah. So this is here. Look at C up top. This is a left eye. So I'm sitting temporal right here. My incision is at six o'clock and okay. the web is at 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So I'm going, and you can even go a little inferior. If the, if the patient has a prominent cheekbone, you can go a little bit inferior temporal. Uh, right. As long as you, before I make my incision, I, I throw a gonial prism. I put a gonial prism on the eye and I look for the ostomy. Mm -hmm. And if the ostomy is a little bit superior nasal, right here, then you can make your incision uh, in for a temporal and go reach across. Uh, if it's right here, sometimes you can go here and you can reach across more temporal, but I like to always um, know if the patient has a prominent cheekbone, then you have to go more temporal. So you can make your, your incision more temporal if, it's, if they have a prominent cheekbone. But in this situation, what I usually do is I make it uh, almost 180 degrees away from the sclerotomy site. Right. And the mitomycin, uh, you're using like, you're putting previews like one week prior to this technique? Yeah, so I used to do that. In the exam lane, I would inject one week before, but I actually should change that slide. Now I, I even do it just in the operating room. Um, so right here, this is before I've made any incisions on the eye. I'll rotate the globe down and then I'll inject as far posterior as possible. Uh -huh. um, Where I, where I know the flap is and where I think I'm going to be directing flow is where I want the mitomycin C to be. And uh, these patients are, I, I, I do this as a block, but you can do it topical. Okay. Um, and, um, and if you do it as a block, then you can just give undiluted mitomycin C, um, either 0.1 cc's or 0.1 millimeter of 0.4 mito or you can give 0.2 milliliters of 0.2 mito, which again, the same amount as 40 micrograms. Um, but you can, if, if it doesn't look that scarred, you can give 20 micrograms. Uh, but these patients have already showed that they can scar because they already have scarred once. They've already been given mito because they've had a prior trab. Mm -hmm. uh, but I like to push at least 40 micrograms, inject at least 40 micrograms of mitomycin C. All right. That makes sense. Yes. Okay. So let's see. Um, so yeah. So we. I mean, these. You can do this in blebs and trabec after you know six months after trabeculectomy. You can do this even ten years after trabeculectomy. The, in this study, the mean age of the bleb was almost seven years. Um, and we have you know this by the time we published this study, it, the patients had a, almost a year follow up but they went from you know, pressures of 22 and 3.7 meds down to 12 and 0.8 meds. Four of these eyes went on to need another tube shunt. Um, but uh, you could flip it around and say, well, that's 17 patients where I, wasn't, I didn't have to put a tube in the eye and I was able to open up their old, their old trabeculectomy. And what I like about this technique is one, it's successful, but two, it really helps create hey, that nice, Um, that nice bleb morphology because you're not unroofing the whole flap. You're just unroofing that posterior component of the flap. Uh, intraoperatively, I, you're going to have low pressure. So I leave some helon in the eye. Um, I give the patient one drop of atropine and then I give them a subtenons injection of 40 milligrams of Kenalog just to really help control inflammation. And then postoperatively, I treat the eye for the first week with the steroids and antibiotics. Um, I usually keep them on atropine once a day or twice a day to prevent them from getting a choroidal because their pressure is going to be low. Um, and then I keep them on steroids four times a day um, until everything is calmed down and then I taper it down. Um, but this isn't a new idea. Um, you know, this has been done in the past um, and Dick Simmons is one that published this back uh, in the 90s. But what he did was he... Um, He made a corneal paracentesis right, right through the mid-peripheral cornea. 
put in Helon, and then with a cyclodialysis spatula, went through the ostomy and, and opened it up. What I like about this technique is that, uh, you're, you know, sometimes if you make a wound, I don't like making wounds right, right where the cornea is, then you have to put a suture into it, it leaks, it can induce a lot of astigmatism. I like coming from below. Um, two, the spatula that I have is a lot longer, so you can really get that posterior, posterior dissection. And then three, the spatula is flat and blunted, because if you do a cyclodialysis spatula, if the conjunctiva is thin, you can poke right through the conjunctiva. And I've done that before with the cyclodialysis spatula. Um, so again, I said, this was my, um, my morning coffee routine now that with the coronavirus, uh, but some people are suggesting making a different type of coffee called quarantine coffee, which is just like, just like normal coffee, but it has a margarita and, and no coffee. Uh, but, uh, Anyway, so uh, uh, I'm going to move on to some some innovations in tube shunts uh, now. Are there any other questions about the blood revision? Yes, they will tell me, uh, let's see, what gonio lens are you using in that technique? So uh, in this picture, I'm using just a four mirror gonio prism, which is, um, which is autoclavable. But what I've switched to now is actually the Ahmed gonio prism, um, which is a single lens that can rotate that Ike Ahmed designed. Um, and it's a little bit higher magnification, but it, it, it's not a Sean Jacobs. You need an indirect, you need a prism, not a direct view, um, because you need to be able to look underneath the, uh, you need to look the opposite way. Um, and you don't, it's harder if you tilt the head. So it's a four mirror gonio prism or a one mirror indirect gonio prism. Um, and other question is, uh, for how much time in, in your experience with this technique, uh, this blep survive, survive? So, um, you know, we've been doing this now for three years. And, and I have patients that are three years out, four years out that um, um, actually we published it in 17, but I started doing it in 16. Um, so yeah, we have patients that are three or four years out uh, that were still working, number one. And then number two, uh, there are patients where it worked and then three years later, or two years later, it fails, just like a trap will fail. Uh -huh. uh, but then I'll go back and do it again. And, mm -hmm. uh, and those patients that I've done that on, they still are continuing to work. Because what I like about this is, again, you get this type of blood morphology. You don't get the, um, that, uh, that pale ischemic anterior bleb. You still maintain some nice, healthy um, vas vas vessels at the limbus. You're directing flow posterior. So, um, you know, these are all patients that have already failed once. So they're at high risk of failing. But I've had really good experience with this, especially the two things that, a couple things we changed from this technique that Dick Simmons was doing was one, the spatula, and then mm -hmm. two, giving more mitomycin C. And I think that's key. Giving more mito at the same time really helps ensure the success rate. Um, what kind of anesthesia are you used? Uh, like only topic or retro bulbar? Or... Uh, I usually do peribulbar. Uh -huh. um, but that's because at my center, the anesthesiologist block, and so the patient comes in the room already blocked. Um, but you could do, you could, you could easily do this. Uh, I would say the first time you try it, do it as a block. Um, but the more comfortable you get, um, you can probably do this topical with some intracameral lidocaine. Perfect. All right. Uh, and there was a question about whether I tried this at the slit lamp. Um, uh -huh. you know, for the same reason, the, the problem with the slit lamp I don't like is, um, is that with, when you're going through a needle and you're breaking through, you're coming anterior and you're going through blood vessels to get to the, spa, to the, to the scar tissue. And you, you kind of sometimes can't see what you're doing and then you don't have control over the chamber. And if the pressure goes too low, the you have a problem. What I like about this is that it, uh, you can leave helon in the eye afterwards Number one, number two, um, you're going through fibrous tissue that has no blood vessels. So you're less likely to get a bleed. And I think it's a little bit more controlled. 
and you're like, yeah, you're less likely to bleed. Okay. So let's talk about now some tube shunts. Now I know um, you guys do mostly Ahmed valves because the uh, bar belts are, are very expensive, but. Um, ah, no, uh, here are more expensive the Ahmed than the bar belt. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, then do you guys have access to Adi, the implant from India? Actually, I put that now. Okay, good. <laughs> Good. Yeah. <laughs> so that's helpful. And then New World Medical has come up with a similar implant called ClearPath. Uh, ah, that also, but I bet you nothing is going to be cheaper than the Audi. Yes, uh, I think so too. So this is, uh, you know, in the U.S. we have access to, to all the different things: Maltinos, bar belts, and ClearPath, but we don't have access to the Audi. Mm -hmm. I had I had some friends tell me that they did not do bar belts because they didn't have a proper assistant in the operating room. They operated at a facility where they were just doing a lot of cataract surgeries and they didn't have an assistant to hold the muscles. And so this made me come up with an idea uh, called the double muscle hook. Um, and this is what it looks like, uh, or a muscle, double muscle speculum. And it's a, basically a speculum where you, you, know, you can, if it's open, uh, it looks like this, and then you can squeeze it and then turn the dial and then it locks it open in place. And it's curved um, around, this is something, my, my instrument guy made, made these by hand, but now they're a little bit more natural curved to match the curvature of the globe. And so what you do is you can, uh, you can, you know, you hook the muscle, this is a left eye, so you hook the superior and the lateral rectus muscle and you lock it into place and then you hand it to your assistant and then your assistant holds it and then, then you have two free hands to put in the tube and then you, you're free and you don't have to depend, any, anybody can hold it for you. They, you don't have to have a, a specific skilled assistant. Um, and you can adjust how wide it opens by squeezing it and turning the dial. Um, and then now you have two hands and you can just insert it. So let's show the video of that. Um, and first, um, again, I'm isolating the lateral rectus and the superior rectus. So I can see where I'm going. And then I come in with the double muscle speculum and I hook the superior rectus. And then I'll hook the inferior rectus. And then I'm going to squeeze the top and it expands it. And then you can see my hand come in and I'm going to turn the wheel to, lock, to expand it and lock it as far as you want it to lock. And then I hand it over to my assistant and now I have two hands. And then with the muzzle speculum, a muzzle hook, I put, in, put it in one quadrant and then I put it in the other quadrant. And that's a 350 bar belt, but the Audi is the same thing. Yeah, very nice. And then I undo the wheel and then, and then come out. Um, and so this is, this is this, I did this because I had friends and colleagues uh, that said they didn't do a bar belt. And then I also like to, I always like to test it. They didn't do a bar belt um, because they didn't have someone that, they, that, that could help hold the muscles. Um, so um, this is, again, I'm getting all these comics. So uh, <laughs> I don't know what, this, what, this, what the phrase of D WTF or what the F in Spanish is, but I, hopefully you guys know what WTF is. Um, <laughs> <You say no>. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty ubiquitous. <laughs> so, um, hey, down there. And yeah. what uh, drainage device do, do you prefer, the Amet or the verbal? Uh, I do everything. I do everything. Um, it depends on the patient. Mm -hmm. So I do Ahmed's in patients where the pressure is very high and I need the pressure down immediately. I do it in my uveitics. Um, and then sometimes I'll do it in my older patients that are very old, like 80 or 85, 90 years old, where I just want the pressure down and I don't want to have to worry about it opening or, 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 or restrictions. Uh, but outside of that, I really have switched over purely now to the 250 um, bar belt 
or now I do the 250 clear path because in the US, the clear path is less expensive. Um, but if the Audi was available, I would do the Audi all the time. Um, but what I've changed a lot is now, I don't really care about the size anymore. Um, you know, it's the only time that size doesn't matter. Um, but I'd now do 250s um, because now if the pressure gets too high afterwards, like we talked about, I think last week, if the pressure gets too high afterwards, then I'll just do a low energy traditional CPC diode or micropulse to lower the pressure to complement the tube. So I'm putting in smaller tubes um, now because I can now supplement it with the, with, if the pressure goes too high, I can supplement it. And getting on to what we talked about, what we're gonna talk about next is what's interesting is the more experience we're getting in tubes, we're, we're running into this problem, which is uh, a tube related hypotony. So uh, we know that over with time and with age, um, our aqueous production goes down. So the aqueous production of a 25 year old is greater than the aqueous production of a 60 year old, which is greater than the aqueous production of an 80 year old. And so what we're seeing now is we're seeing patients um, where when they were you know, 70, even 65, they got a 350 barbell. And now they're 85 and their aqueous production is going down and now their pressure is too low and their pressure is eight on no medications or six on no medications or four on no medications. And they're starting to become a hypotenuse. Uh, so that's the reason why I've moved away from the larger tubes as well, because our, pa our patient population is living longer um, and we're starting to see this problem. So, um, so let me talk about a way we've come up with of m managing this tube related hypotony. Um, and um, this is a case of ab internal flow restriction for uh, tube related hypotony. Glaucoma drainage implants are becoming more common. Aqueous production decreases. Let me see if I can mute that. Hold on. Um, there we go. Okay, so we talked about this. This is aqueous production going down um, as people age. Um, and so here's a patient that. Um, was a 67 year old, 76 year old white female. Um, she had a history of cataract surgery, a, a corneal transplant, SLT, and then she's on uh, max medications. And um, um, her vision is 2050, pressure is 23. She's got a corneal transplant, which is healthy. I put in a, uh, she comes in with a pressure of 23 on max meds. Nerve is 0.75, so I put in a 350 barbell because she has a transplant. Um, and she's done well. And um, at five months later, uh, her vision was about the same. Her pressure was 11. She was on Timolol once a day and steroids three times a day because of the transplant. So I sent her back to her referring ophthalmologist. And, um, and then she comes back two years later. Her vision is low. She has some corneal edema. Her pressure is 10 and she's just on steroids. And then her husband passed away and she, I don't see her again for, uh, um, for oh, that's why, she, that's why I lost her to follow up. Um, and then she comes back two years later after her husband, pa her husband passed away. Now her vision's 2080, her pressure's four. Uh, she's still on steroids. Um, she has um, macular ed edema vitreo macular, macular traction. She has good flow to the plate, but her pressure is four. And, um, and so what are the options, right? You can take out the tube entirely. You can take out the tube um, and put in a smaller tube. You can trim the plate and then tie it off and start over. But then, you know, I thought, are there any, any ab internal options? Um, and so what I did, Let's see. This was described um, out of Korea using uh, multiple uh, 5 nylon sutures with an Ahmed. But what I did was I took the patient back to the operating room. This is a, a 4 -0 proline, very similar to what we do with GAT. I blunted it. This is topical. Through two small paracentesis, I put the suture in the eye and cannulated it 
and it's like a snake swallowing an egg. You can see I just completely pl blocked it off entirely. Um, and um, and then I just then I just trimmed it and left it left it in the eye. So you can see I blunted it. I put in two iris hooks because the iris was kind of in the way and the tube is in the sulcus because she had a PK, a corneal transplant. And then I'm, I'm pushing it through the, through the tube and it's completely occluded. The, the bulb is so big that it's, uh, or that there's loose. So I'm gonna make it bigger. So I made it bigger. And so now you can see it's gonna be harder to push in It's really completely occluding it. And then I go in and I trim the suture. It's not going anywhere because it's so big. It's already, it's just stuck in the, in the lumen of the tube. Um, and then I wash everything out. All right. And do you need some visco there? No, no, I wash it all out because the tube is now completely closed. I use Visco to do it, and then I wash out all the Visco. All right. So I left the operating room feeling pretty proud of myself. I gave myself a pat on the back, and <laughs> the next day she was had a pressure of 40. Uh, and then I put her back on everything, and then her pressure ended up being 25 or 30. And then I was remembering why I put the tube in the first place. Um, and so now... Um, what are our options? Same options, right? I can take out the tube, I can replace it with a smaller tube, I can trim the plate, or I can try something again, ab interno. And you guys know I'm gonna try something ab interno, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so now what I did was use a 5 proline, and um, actually, no, sorry, it's still a 4 proline, but I blunted it, but I blunted it not so much that it would block off the tube, I just blunted it so it would take up some of the, sp the volume of the tube. And look, you can even see it going in right here, mm -hmm. going to the plate. So now it's taken up the volume of the tube and making, made the lumen smaller. But the problem is, is that now it's just can it can fall out, right? So I'm thinking, well, what can I do? What can I do? And so I push it through the wall of the tube. And so now it's stuck in the wall of the tube and it won't move. That way I know the tube won't migrate out. And so you can see now this is slit lamp afterwards. Um, you can see that it's, um, that this is, it's going up to the plate. It's not blocking the plate. You still see some flow to the plate. Um, and, and this is what it looks like. The tube is in the sulcus and it's going through the wall of the tube, the suture, and it's holding the suture into place. And, um, and her cornea is still clear, her transplant is still good, and now I'm not worried that the tube is going to come back in the eye. This was a, over a year ago, she's 14, now she's about 16 months out, but her vision is uh, 2080, about the same, 2060, 2080. Her pressure is now eight, and she's on steroids um, twice a day. Uh, so this was a way for me to address the issue of hypotony, tube-associated hypotony, um, without having to touch the conjunctiva. And, um, and I was able to perform under topical anesthesia without incising the conjunctiva, I was able to kind of titrate it and make the bulb size and the lumen size depending on how much I wanted the pressure to go up. And, um, and then I embedded the suture into the wall of the eye, into the wall of the tube so that it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't move. Um, so that's a, again, a way that our patients are constantly teaching us to be better. And, and I think, the more and more you have experience with tubes, the more you're going to see this problem of tube-associated hypotony. Uh, are there any questions about that? Uh, I think we were talking about uh, when you put this proline inside of the lumen, uh, proline stay inside? That's yes. Question. This is a case of ab internal yeah. flow restriction for tube. I mean, move to the anterior chamber. 
Yes. Yeah. The two. The state this, there, is, right? this is this is what she looks like one year later. These are slit lamp pictures one year later. So it's it stays in the it's this is in the tube going up to the plate. And um, and this is what it looks like at this. This is that slit lamp photograph one year later of what the patient looks like. Perfect. Okay. So um, now we're going to talk about other problems we're experiencing with tubes is these, you know, tubes are typically done in, in sick patients and eyes that have been through a lot. And so this is uh, management of complex tube erosions. And this is something we published back in 2013, but we've been doing for a while. And the name is kind of long and tenuous, but it's called fornicial mean, meaning it comes from the fornix, conjunctival, uh, a pedicle flap. And I'm gonna define some of these terms. Uh, so this is a 30, a 63 year old female um, with a history of ice syndrome and thyroid disease and diabetes. She had a corneal transplant, a cataract surgery, a trabeculectomy and an omet. And then she presents uh, with a tube erosion in her left eye. She's on um, bromonidine, timolol, and FML, uh, fluoromethylone uh, ophthalmic solution, a mild steroid. Um, she's like, it's, her, it's an uh, ice syndrome, so she doesn't see well. Her pressure's decent, but she has extensively scarred conjunctiva um, and advanced glaucoma. Um, and this is what her uh, OCT looks like. Her right eye, thankfully, as classically you see with ice, is healthy. Um, but this is what she looks like. This is actually some mascara, um, but this is the tube erosion right here. You can see all this conjunctiva is scarred down with an old trabeculectomy. Nothing you can do here. Um, and so again, what are the options for repair? Um, you can revise it directly and try to close it, but there's really no conjunctiva. You can take conjunctiva from another area, cut it out and bring it over and put it on top, an autograft. Uh, you can try to cover it with sclera or pericardium and then cover as much as possible and hope that the vessels come through. Uh, or more invasive, you can reposition the tube and, you know, uh, or put one down below inferiorly. Uh, or you can take it out entirely and then do a diode or an ECP. But let's take a step back and talk about skin flaps. So why do, and we've been learning from our general surgery colleagues, why do we do a skin flap? So a skin flap is used to provide skin coverage in an area, usually in burn patients or plastic surgery, provide skin and coverage to an area that doesn't have skin and doesn't have vascularity. It doesn't have blood vessels. And so you need to understand also the, the, the dimensions of a flap. Typically, the proportions based on the plastic surgery literature are three to one. So if you're if your flap is three, three millimeters long, the base should be one millimeter uh, because you need to make sure that enough blood is going through that flap to help provide uh, vascularity to the distal flap. So the longer it needs, it is the wider it needs to be. Um, An interpolated flap, the word interpolated means that you're not just bringing a flap here and moving it here. You're actually bringing a flap here and moving it to an entirely different area over some healthy tissue. So a pedicle flap is the same thing as a flap. And so you're doing an interpolated flap where you're bringing tissue from a source, bringing it over healthy tissue, and then bringing it somewhere else while still maintaining the attachment. Um, and so, you know, flaps in ophthalmology we use with, uh, you know, a Gunderson flap or a Hughes flap, but a lot of, we don't use them a lot in, in, in glaucoma. But I think one of the reasons why people get tube erosions is because you're not getting proper blood vessel supply to that tissue over the, um, over the tube. And, you know, I know in, in Central and South America, they do a lot of the tunnels, they, they do a lot of scleral tunnels instead of in the US, we still use a lot of corneal patch grafts or um, uh, pericardial patch grafts or scleral patch grafts. But regardless of how you cover it, I think the most important part of preventing you from having a tube erosion is the health of the conjunctiva over that area. And if that conjunctiva is healthy 
and vascularized, I don't think you're going to get an erosion. I think you're at highest risk of getting an erosion when you lose your blood vessels around that area and then the tissue doesn't get healthy. So what I like about this flap technique is you're bringing in healthy tissue. You're bringing in healthy vasculature to an area that has been deprived of blood vessels. And so we got an artist to help us draw it. So what you did was here's the erosion. We cauterize around it. I suture it. I would actually say now I change my technique a little bit. I actually will pull out the tube and redirect it a little bit to a different area. Um, but I covered it here with corneal patch, a corneal patch graft. And then what we do, this is in conjunction with one of my colleagues who's an oculoplastic surgeon, is he double everts the lid to get access to the fornix. And then he cuts a piece of the fornix out while maintaining this base, this flap. And then he rotates it over healthy tissue to the area that needs it. And then I suture it here. And this whole area is still, it's healthy. It's not a symblepheron. It's still healthy and they're still mobile. And actually you can pass uh, a probe underneath here because it's, it's going over it and you still have that. It's not attaching here. It's attaching at the base. So let's show this the video. video demonstrating the use of uh, the conjunctival pedicle. So here's that patient with ice syndrome that I presented. You can see this is the old trab. This is mascara. Um, and uh, really just, it's, it's a lot of scarred tissue. You can't do anything up there. But the patient has some healthy tissue posteriorly. So I'm dissecting around the tube. Making a nice pocket. And then I, I also like to suture, this is a nino, ni, uh, nino nylon. I like to suture the tube to the wall of the eye. And this is corneal patch graft and I'm tucking that cornea in that pocket that I made. And then I'm gonna suture it in place. And then my colleague um, is going to come in, who's the oculoplastic surgeon. And he's going to do things that I've never seen done before, um, which he double everts the lid and then puts a suture through the tarsus to really provide some good exposure. And then he's mapping out a three to one ratio of the one millimeter or one centimeter base and, uh, and this is a lidocaine with epi to help control bleeding. And then he's doing a partial thickness flap with a little bit of tenons um, and conjunctiva from the fornix. And he can do this in his head now. He's done so many. He helped invent this technique. But now we have a, I mean, pause it real quick. So now we have, you know, we brought that flap over to the area of defect. And now I'm just lining it up um, and, and gonna, I'm going to suture it down. And this is 8 vicro. And again, you just, it doesn't need to be everywhere. You just need to reapproximate it and then it'll become vas vas vascularized and epithelialized. But look at the health of that tissue compared to the surrounding tissue. The blood vessels the, and the tenons is so much healthier than this area over here, uh, which is the key to success. And this just closes by its own and you don't get some blepharon or any scarring at all. Um, and so this is what the patient looked like on the first day. Um, again, it looks like a symblepheron, but it's not a symblepheron. You can actually, if you had a probe, you could pass it underneath this, this flap. It's not scarred down. You have full mobility. And this is what she looks like uh, on the first day. This is what it looks like on the first month. Again, just this tissue coming from the fornix down over it. Look at those vessels compared to the vessels, no vessels here and the vessels over here. And um, four years later, 
she still had motion, her pressure still controlled, uh, no evidence of erosion at all, and the pedicle flap is still intact. And this is what she looks like. You can't see that anything was done. There's no ptosis or anything like that, and there's no restriction of movement. You can't tell anything was done to the lid at all. Um, and this is what she looks like. Again, nice, healthy, flat um, conjunctiva with good vasculature. And again, it's not a symblepharon. This is just a flap of tissue coming down. You could still pass a, a probe underneath here because it's just tissue over a tissue. Um, we, we have patients that are 10, 15 years out uh, and these are people that have had multiple surgeries. If you look at our paper, we have a, a table um, on, uh, on, the, on the number of surgeries and, and, and how long they've lasted. But these are patients that are, have had you know, six or seven surgeries, scarred conjunctiva. The risk of erosion, when you look at other techniques, is almost 50% recurrence. Uh, we don't see that with this. But again, the key thing is making sure that dimension is three to one um, and, uh, and bringing in healthy vessels. Yeah, so this is our paper. Um, we have uh, a third of these patients had diabetes, 15 patients of 15 eyes of 14 patients, 80% had undergone more than four uh, prior surgeries. And our mean follow up time is almost 50 months. And no history of recurrent erosion. Um, but this will this paper goes it has a chart on every single patient. But we've been doing this now for a very long time and have had tremendous success with it. So, you know, tubes are becoming more common. We're going to start to see complications in these eyes that have been through so much. Tube erosions are a very challenging problem. And when you look at all the other techniques of prior closure or redirecting, none of them bring in healthy tissue to the area. And you can do this in combination with a, um, and not all of them need it. If you have enough tissue that you can close it, you don't need to do this. This is only for the most advanced cases where there's a lot of scar tissue and you need to recruit some healthy tissue. Um, and we initially described this actually back in 2003, and then the paper we did in 13 um, uh, provided a little more long-term follow-up. Um, so are there any questions about that? No, I mean, it's a comment on, uh, only that have a lot of sense because when you put that flap there, the vasculature stills there, so... Yeah everything became healthy, like you said, right? Because a lot of people uh, would think that you will cut completely that flap and put it there. It's dead. Right? But not like this technique. Exactly. So yeah, when you do the autograft, if you cut the conjunctiva out and you uh -huh. remove it, you've just amputated all of the blood supply, which yes. is the most important thing. Uh, so these, the reason why you get these erosions is you need blood vessels at the limbus. And, 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 and that's, a, that's a key part of, of this technique. So all these... And, and there's some, also a question. Uh, what is your recommendation to not touch the Mueller muscle and avoid uh, some dipo, dipo, diplopia? Uh, um, you're, you're actually, you're not touching the... Um, you're not touching Mueller's at all. You're going. Uh -huh. You're only. You're only taking tissue from the fornix. The 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 fornix. Uh, the fornicial conjunctiva. You're not touching the tarsal conj at all. So it it has no impact on the lid movement, at all. Perfect. So um, all these instruments. Again, I have no financial interest in any of these instruments. Um, uh, but all these instruments are made by uh, this gentleman right here, Mateen Amin, who's helped me design all my, I come up with that crazy idea and he you know, helps me put it and he helps design it. And then he sends it to me and we work on things. Um, so we have a couple other things in the works uh, that are still coming out, but uh, he helps me design it all. Um, what I like about him is he's a mad scientist. He's very, very smart and he helps create um, and improve on, on these instruments. Uh, number two, he will donate 6% of sales to, um, to our foundation to help us uh, take care of patients and do educational t events and things like that. But what the, what the thing I like is um, in, uh, in Central and South America and in India and in African countries and in China, 
he actually doesn't make a profit off of instruments. He sells them essentially at cost. So, um, uh, so he usually, he up, he up charges, uh, the United States and Europe and Canada. Um, but, uh, but in, in, in other parts of the world, he, uh, he sells them essentially at cost or sometimes he sells them at a loss. Um, so he's, uh, he's really been helping me in, uh, in one, helping me design these instruments and two, making them accessible um, around the world uh, in a very affordable way. Uh, Sounds like a good deal. He makes a lot of microsurgical instruments as well. Um, and the ones that are stainless steel, the ones I do with GAT, I think are like $150, $200. Uh, the titanium ones um, are, are more expensive. Maybe they, I think they're maybe eight hundred dollars U.S. dollars, but the uh, titanium ones. What I what I respect about him is that he provides a lifetime warranty. So if they break or bend or have any problems, he'll replace them for free, forever. Well, um, he won't provide the same warranty with stainless steel, but the stainless steel ones are a lot less expensive. So if you take care of them, they're fine. Um, but you can email him if you have any questions, or email me. I'm happy to help with that. Um, but you know, in conclusion. Really, I, I, I walk into clinic every day. I try to remember that, uh, that the patients, they're trying to teach us about this disease and about what we don't understand. And if you pay attention, you'll learn from them. And if you're not learning something every day from your patients, you're not paying attention. And you know, this is the golden age of glaucoma surgery. Uh, we're coming up with newer and more exciting things to do. And sometimes you have to, you have to be willing to continually adapt to try new things, to be uncomfortable in the operating room. Um, and, and I would say whenever you're in the operating room you're gonna, and you're gonna try something new, ask one of your colleagues, one of your senior colleagues to come with you. So he or her, he or she can, can be there just thinking and watching while you're in the hot seat. And that's what I do uh, every time I try to come up with something. I have my partner, Ron Feldman, sit next to me so I'm working and he's thinking and we always provide something better um, because of that. And it provides you that safety net to, um, uh, to try new things and know that someone is gonna be there to help you in case there's a problem. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of things you can do now ab interno that don't require having to incise the conjunctiva and thinking about the glaucoma surgery from the inside out. Um, so, um, and then, yeah, whenever you think about something crazy, bring in a colleague. So, um, and, you know, don't do what I do. Uh, everything I come up with is reusable and not disposable, and you don't make any money off that. If you want to make money, come up with something disposable. Um, so, uh, you know, again, we, uh, the GOP is our Republican Party in the United States, and um, who thought that they're, you know, our president got on TV couple uh, last week and said, Hey, guess what? Some of you are going to die. It's going to be okay. Oh. Uh, so hopefully you guys have a, a leader that's a little bit better and a little bit um, more encouraging. Um, but uh, you know, at this point we think it would be nice to get um, a briefing from the coronavirus <laughs> on how it's going to keep us safe from our president. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but anyway, this reminds me, I was trying to bring this video up. Let me see if I can do something real quick. The last time I was there, um, I had the most amazing um, video and I wanted to share this with everybody because this was the last, this was uh, Copa America 2019. Yeah. My favorite video. So, uh, <laughs> I hope in these times of um, where things are tough and, uh, you know, we, what I loved about that is we stopped the entire meeting to, yeah. watch, to watch Peru, uh, the national team play. And um, I hope in these times of, of, of toughness and fear and concern and worry and, and, and sickness um, and sacrifice when we're all taking the self-quarantine that we, we think of moments like that 
and we enjoy, you know, this is my son. We put him in a, his Halloween costume. His, he was a king. We're going on walks. I know you guys can't go on walks. And this is my wife. She's a pediatric anesthesiologist. This is what she has to wear now to protect herself from Corona. Uh, but, uh, but during all these times that we still, you know, take advantage, we stay safe, but we take this, take this time to spend time with each, our loved ones and our family and, um, and don't forget to laugh um, and look back at, at, at pictures and memories. And this hopefully will soon all be over. So um, again, great times down in Paracas. The last time I was in, in Peru. Um, I'm thinking about you guys all the time and hope you stay safe. And uh, thank you again for this chance to, uh, to talk and to, to talk to you guys about some of the fun stuff that we're, we're doing and what we're trying to do. So uh, thank you guys. And let me know if you have any questions. Hey, thank you very much again, uh, Davinder, for participating in these webinars. I'm sure uh, everyone here is enjoying uh, your talk. And we are very happy to have you again, my friend. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure, Juan Carlos. All right. Uh, I ask you about the drainage device because uh, actually from... 2009 that I don't use Amet valve because you doing, know the, the, all the inflammatory cytokines touch the plate from the first day. So it's more risk for fibrosis. That's why it's a headache for me to put a Amet valve instead of a Verbelt or Audi. Wait, so which way? You, you only do Ahmed's or you stop doing Ahmed's? I missed it. I'm sorry. No, I, I stopped that from 2009. Only okay. put like, uh, I only put a uh, bare belt. Okay. Okay. So what do you do when the patient has a pressure of 50? Uh, fenestrations. Okay. I, I do usually three fenestrations in the tube and the pressure is between uh, always. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's good. I mean, I think it's safer long term because then the tube opens up in a uh, in a non-inflamed eye. But uh, but I feel like sometimes with these bad bad diabetics and the pressure is so high uh, with the neovascular glaucoma, I feel like sometimes I don't have a choice. Um, things I have tried because um, I do agree with you. I think that the non-valved implants work yeah. better long term uh, mm -hmm. than the valved implants. Um, is sometimes I will when I do a bar valve, I'll fenestrate, but sometimes the fenestrations don't work. And then, you know, a week later, two weeks later, the pressure's back up to 40 and you're on everything and you have, you know, you're waiting two more weeks before you can open it. Um, some things what I've done is, uh, when I don't want to do an Ahmed, is at the same time, I'll do maybe a hemi gat to open uh -huh. up a little bit of the angle at uh -huh. the same time. Uh, okay. And sometimes like uh, we talked about last time, is uh, possibly at the same time doing a CPC or a micropulse, uh, again, to give you that little benefit to lower the pressure while, it's, while the eye is waiting for the tube to heal. Yeah, yeah. So now we are in a time that we uh, are beginning to mix everything, right? Yeah. Like, and for the patient and also for us. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Yeah. So, eh, ¿alguna pregunta, por favor? ¿Alguien tiene alguna pregunta para el doctor Davinder? Let's see. Ah. Eh, do you perform a needling in the amet bulb when, it, when you have fibrosis? Um, no, no, I don't. Um, I, I would think that if you just needle it, then it would scar back down. Um, but in those situations where you have this fibrotic tissue, you know the valve is working, but you can see the bleb. Um, in those patients, that's when I do a s traditional CPC diode uh, mm -hmm. of you know 1,100 milliwatts, 4,000 milliseconds, and 30 spots. So I. I typically would do a diode mm -hmm. uh, for them as opposed to um, um, to anything else. Yeah, I prefer to do that too. 
¿Alguna otra pregunta? Uh, let's see. Only thank you, thank you. Um, what else? Ah, I have one question. In, in the moment you are in your AB internal uh, blood prohibition, have you ever in that moment instead of mitomycin in that moment, uh, Avastin, because you have uh, the risk that mitomycin go inside of the anterior chamber? You're breaking up a little bit. Do I ever do Avastin because of what? Instead of mitomycin. Oh, um, no, no, sometimes I'll do both. I do think Avastin is important and there's an antifibrotic component to Avastin. Um, but with mitomycin C, what I do is um, before, uh, before I even do the flap or the revision, I'll rotate the globe down, I'll inject a small amount, you know, 0.1 or 0.4 mito, so 40 micrograms, far, far back. And then you can wait just a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you do your paracentesis, you pump up the eye with helon, and then you do your revision, and then you irrigate more, that helon goes out in the subconjunctival space. All the studies that have shown, and we just did a big review on mitomycin C in the Journal of uh, Glaucoma, um, talks about um, uh, the binding of mitomycin C. And after about five or 10 minutes, it's pretty much all bound and inactive. And, um, and so I think what happens is when you're irrigating in the eye and the bleb gets bigger, you're also diluting the mitomycin C. So I think it's a very low risk of, um, of refluxing into the eye. Uh, okay. And so I think mitomycin C is very important to use. Uh, I was initially very cautious, which is why I used to do it one week before. So then you pre-treat the area with mito, and then one week later you go in the operating room and you do it, and then you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but just now, just for patient flow, um, and also safety because with Zen, and with in focus, even with my traps, we're getting um, we're getting more and more comfortable um, injecting mitomycin C. So um, um, we uh, I, I, I don't we're not seeing we've been doing this technique for about three years, four years, and we're not seeing any side effects from injecting mito as long as you um, um, make it um, as long as you pump up the eye and it dilutes it. And, and you do it beforehand. But I like, I like Avastin as well. I think they can both be done um, because I think both are, uh, are, are important, especially in these patients. The unique thing about these patients is they've already shown you that they will scar because they've already done it once before. So I think they're at a higher risk of scarring. Um, and, um, and so you want to do everything you can to, uh, to prevent it. Perfect. So, is there other question? ¿Alguna otra pregunta para el doctor Gavinder? Parece que no. Parece que no, ¿no, Mirel? Mm -hmm. Podemos todos entonces abrir los micrófonos para darle un aplauso al, al doctor Gavinder. Sí, sí. Sí. ¡Bravo! ¡Bravo! Sí. Thank you for organizing this. It's always, it's always so much fun. And, um, Thank you, Dr. Danny Van. I hope you guys continue to stay safe and, um, and we'll, um, we'll hopefully be in touch soon. Yeah, of course, of course, of course, I'm in there. Thank you very much. And for Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, guys. Take care. We can do something in the future here in Lima. Thank you. Yes, I hope so. I have, I, there's, there's more I have if you ever need anything. We can talk. If you'd like me to do something else, I'm happy to do it. Yes, of course. Okay. Thank you very All right. much. All right, guys, you be safe. Take care. Thank you very much, Doc. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.